And we're going to review some things tonight that we've already talked about, whether it was in, and that's what's so crazy. We were studying the Song of Songs last week, and there was actually the four kingdoms popped up in the Song of Songs. And as I was studying for the Song of Songs for tomorrow's class, the four kingdoms popped up there too. And I'm like, I've never seen the four kingdoms stand out so frequently, which just kind of shows you once you're onto something, you see it everywhere. And um, so we're gonna keep along that thread since I don't seem to be able to outrun it. Um, and probably next week as well. Um, I wanna kind of put some, a mishmash of things about the dragon together tonight. Um, that pertain to the Torah portion and what happened with the Hebrew boys um, and Pharaoh. And then I also want to look forward to next week where we'll, we'll continue looking at the dragon. But I think next week we just, we kind of want to study the anatomy of the dragon because we get definite anatomy hints in the book of Revelation that we're not gonna have time to look at tonight, like the heads and the horns and, and the tail and all that stuff. Um, so maybe next week we'll go into more detail about dragon anatomy. But for, night, for tonight, we just wanna get on, review some things to make sure we're, we're set in them before we proceed. Because this is deeper than I've ever taught these Torah portions before. I've given little hints here and there and you know, part of next week's is almost verbatim out of workbook four. Um, but it was in much smaller bites than the speed at which we're going right now. But I think that's important because we're going to talk about mid mid midwives tonight and their role in this thing. Because remember, um, I found some things after last week's class that I put into the live stream. If you haven't watched it, and it concerns the bookends. You know, we kept talking about the 27th of Tibet. What's going to happen with that prophecy? Was it just for three times in history? Or is it a possibility every year when the 27th of Tibet comes, or excuse me, the uh, 12th of Tibet comes along? Is there something that can be set in place every single year? And so in looking for that, I went, just went back to the same source, World Health Organization. I was looking for a large system that would affect the world. And of course, World Health System's pretty big. And so at that same site where I found the COVID-19 documented on the fast of Tibet, on the 10th of Tibet, I pull it up and I get a full page with all kinds of articles and videos declaring that 2020 was the year of the midwife. And so the, the GPS that we're getting in the Torah portions, both at the 10th of Tibet in January of last year, and then on December 25th, because we had two 10th of Tibets. So they created bookends in that Gregorian year of 2020 which ironically does come up at 2020. But if you have time, go back and pull up that live stream from Shabbat and you'll see the extra material that I included um, on the YouTube live stream. Because I, I still wanna keep looking at that because the midwife, that's what it's pointing us to. It's saying, look at the midwives. If, if we wanna know what's happening now, Look at the midwives, and it may be that understanding the role of the midwives is going to help us in the Gregorian year 2021 as well. So let me maximize this where you can see it. Oh, and here's your uh, memory page. We started a new page on your memory book. So if you're wanting to memorize the Torah portions, from Exodus, it's Shemot, and Shemot, Shem is name, and Shemot is plural, names. And it gives you the names of the, the sons and some of the daughters of Israel who went down to Egypt, and then later were told that the boundaries of the nations were set according to that number 
which is 70. And there's, of course, going to be discussion about how that 70 is determined. We won't deal with that tonight. Um, but the sentence I came up with, and maybe you can do better in your memory book, but I just put the Shemot, the names of 70 Israelites who went to Egypt, determined the boundaries of the nations represented by their bondage in Egypt. So pretty much for that Torah portion, I just wanted to reflect that this is instead of the, the hints of bondage that we got in last week's Torah portion, the first Torah portion of Shemot shows us how we're definitely in bondage now, no question. Which brings us to the readings. If you're listening by audio, it's Exodus 1, 1 through 6, 1. The Psalm is 99, the Haftorah, and the Haftor is very important. And I wish I had another full day to go through that with you because it's a warning about nursing children in the faith. And it goes back to the nurses and the midwives. 2020 was the year of the nurse and the midwife. And Yeshua said, whoa, to those who were nursing in those days, it's not going to be a good thing to be a baby in the word no matter how old you are, it's not gonna be a good thing to be a baby in the word because the monster wants to kill you. And he has different methods of hunting you and killing you. Um, and so that's gonna be my main prayer going forward this year is that the babies and not just baby babies, like real babies, but also spiritual babies. I think we're in a time of double spiritual harvest but that also means that the dragon's going to be working very hard to try to snatch those babies. We, we have a baby snatcher on the loose. And so his purpose is not just to kill infants, not just to kill even babies in the womb, if we're looking in the natural realm, but his goal is also to kill spiritual babies who don't yet have a strong foundation, who, are, who still haven't figured out what the soul does relative to the spirit. If you don't know that, then you're very liable to be deceived. And um, like Yeshua said, whoa, if, if you're still that nursing child that thinks what you think, feel, or want is the spirit because it might be the influence of a spirit, but it's not a Holy Spirit, that um, there is a, a spirit of the disciplines when we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're gonna need lots of nurses and midwives to, to help any spiritual babies through this coming year. I think it's gonna be very important for us to come alongside people um, who maybe aren't that easy to get along with. You know, that's the thing about babies. They scream a lot and they, you know, make stinkies in their diapers and, they'll run out in the street if you don't watch them and they'll get in all the cabinets if you're not watching them. And even as adults, we do those sorts of things, um, you know, and so we need really patient um, kind of moms and dads because if we don't midwife and nurse these spiritual babies, trust me, there is a monster out in the street. He knows his time is short. He can see the two houses moving closer together. And he's, he's losing the basis of his accusations little by little. He has to see that writing on the wall. Um, anyway, do take time to read the Haftorah and read how um, the, the people who were studying it says, here a little, there a little, precept by precept, line upon line. And we've often heard that as something good, that that's how you learn, little by little, precept by precept, line up on line. But the timing of this Hak Torah tells us there is a time where that's not a good thing, because what it is suggesting is people, like Paul said, at the time you should have been teachers, you're still drinking the milk of the word, and that's not going to sustain you in an evil day. You're going to have to grow up fast. And this is what the Haftor is telling you. You need to grow up fast in the word. Um, 
it's going to be important. The more the times become troubled, the less time you have to wander down the streets and be over at the neighbor's house and those sorts of things. The more important it is for you not to settle for little Facebook posts, for you not to settle for the, the scripture of the day, for you not to settle for the nice verse the, the church puts on its signboard that you drive by going to work every day. It's going to take more than that. It's going to take more than things you can read in two or three minutes. It's going to take effort. It's, it's going to take grown-up work, which was our the message we started off with when all this stuff kicked off. Remember, we did Shabbat of a lifetime. And I said, we got to grow up. We got to be parents. It's important. And it has been important. And so even though we won't get into it, we don't have time, I would like for you to read it completely through and kind of warn people. Um, if you know people that maybe they think they're doing the best they can do in terms of the time that they make for reading the word and prayer, but you might very gently like a nurse or like a midwife suggest to them that maybe there will come a time when a Facebook post a day won't be enough. So that's, that's kind of heavy, but um, for the Brit Chadashah, we're going to hit so many of them. I couldn't isolate just one. So just enjoy that ride as we go. So let's, let's get right into the snake here. We know that one of the signs that Moses used to prophesy the, the defeat of Pharaoh was to turn his rod into a nachash. And he gets a practice run because if you remember, he objects. He's like, oh no, I can't do that. You know, I can't go to Pharaoh. And so Adonai tells him, okay, throw your rod down. And it turns into a nachash. It turns into a snake, a serpent. But when he picks it up, it's just a dead stick. It's nothing to be afraid of. And that's the thing about the beast and the dragon. They're really nothing to be afraid of. Uh, if you are walking in obedience, then you have a better handle on things that are just dead sticks in life. And you understand that there are things that are life. And it's only in this natural world that we look at those things. You know, remember how it says people will walk by the grave of the king of Babylon and say, is this the man that caused the world to tremble? See, once it's over, you're going to see people and things for what they were. And often they aren't that fearsome. Uh, so later, when Moses throws... Um, I put the serpent, when he throws the rod down before Pharaoh and his court, instead of saying Nachash for serpent, which is a land-based serpent, it becomes a Tanin. That's in Exodus 7.10. So that's the difference between Exodus 4, 2 through 4, and then Exodus 7.10. And it's not that it's a different rod or it's a different snake. It's just showing you equivalent expressions that when you say nachash, you have an equivalent expression to the tanin. Now, when things are equivalent, it doesn't mean they're identical because you're supposed to understand some nuance of difference between those two items, like the Torah is a light, the commandment is a lamp. You need to understand that a commandment is like the small piece of the big thing, which is the Torah, which is light. So... If you understand the subtle difference between the two types of snakes, then you'll realize that Moses has control over two kinds of snakes. He can control a nechash, a land-based snake, and he can control the tanin, which is the, the water snake, the sea snake, the sea serpent, the sea monster. And in modern Hebrew, the tanin is a crocodile. Those of you who have been to Tamar with us down in the desert, there's a, a what is it called? The Coco Loco Crocodile Farm or something. Right out there in the desert, there's a crocodile farm. So the dragon's out there in the desert. Uh, but you need to understand 
the difference between those two. Because again, as we start checking the anatomy of the dragon, we will see things come up out of the sea and we will see things that seem to be land-based. We will see things that come out of the air. And for now, it's good because we've been talking about Leviathan and how Leviathan is an equivalent expression for Tanin. And so if Tanin is equivalent to Leviathan and then Tanin is equivalent to Nechash, then we have three types of serpents here. We have the great sea serpent, we have the serpent of the Nile, we have a sea base, uh, land-based serpent, and somehow they're all part of the same picture. So when we look at King Nebuchadnezzar's golden image of himself, that he called in the nations of the world to bow down and worship to it. This is our first real glimpse at the image of the beast. Mm -hmm. And in the image, it's going to represent the world systems of the beast that are going to be contained within four kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the, the feet and the toes are mixed iron and clay. So they have a relationship to the iron kingdom, which is Rome. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to understand the anatomy mm -hmm. of the dragon in Revelation, then we need to understand the relationship of the beast to the dragon. And we're interested in this because as we were looking at all these, these prophecies that seem to be spot on with the plague of COVID this past year, and we see that Ezekiel is the one prophesying about these specific dates, the 10th of Tibet, the 12th of Tibet. Um, and so much of the information, like I just read out of Ezekiel 21, where he's talking about the augury of the liver and how the, the flashing of the liver was used to foretell the future. And that's, again, one more description of the Leviathan about how even his wake in the water is like flashing light. Um, but what we notice in the, the book of Ezekiel is that he's preoccupied with Egypt. And we know that it's Babylon, it, that's the beast that's crouching at the door of Jerusalem. As Ezekiel's prophesying, you think, well, you know, Ezekiel, what is your obsession with Egypt? The people probably need more information about Babylon. That's who's about to crash through the walls and take them captive and destroy the temple. And they're gonna be in captivity for 70 years with Babylon, not with Egypt. Egypt is past history, but it isn't. And we can see that in Ezekiel's preoccupation with Egypt, even during this impending destruction of Jerusalem. And so we see Pharaoh, Egypt, as the father of these succeeding world kingdoms that are represented by King Nebuchadnezzar's image of the beast. And each of those world kingdoms sought to be divine. Um, we could see that in Isaiah and the prophecies against the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre and, and so forth. And um, not just these four world systems, but their daughter systems. That's why we study what's the definition of a daughter in Song of Songs. It's a dependent system. So the four world kingdoms that were represented by that image, each one thought at some point that it was going to be a never ending power. But it's the, the sea dragon specifically that seems to be linked to the image of the beast in Babylon, represented by Nebuchadnezzar II, and then those successive world kingdoms. Babylon gold, then you have the silver of Persia, Medea, you have the bronze of Greece, and then you have the legs of iron, which is Rome. And of course, in the Song of Songs last week, we look at what the mingled iron and clay represented, because these are simply offshoots uh, coming out of Rome. Um, they can 
mingle, but they can't marry, if you'll remember. Um, so let's see, we just went over this. Um, but it, as you look at this image, what you realize is that these were able to mingle. The, it's the feet and the toes that their substance can't mingle with one another. And remember where it says mingle, it was like cleave, like a man cleaves to his wife. So those two systems that came out of Rome, they have mingled doctrines, but they can't marry. They're, they're, they're not that close. They mingle, but they don't marry. And apparently these are gonna be the final two systems that are derived from Rome's two iron legs. But each of those systems above it, when you look at the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron, we consider those Pharaoh's offspring, his offspring. Um, if you remember in the, the gospels, when Jews would get angry with each other over how they were applying the Torah or interpreting the Torah, they would call one another names. And John the Baptist did this, Yeshua did it. They would call one another vipers, sons of vipers, a brood of vipers. And this is what they're talking about. They're, they're telling the other person that your application or, or your understanding of this text, it's, it's coming from the serpent itself. It's, it's coming back, it's coming from the father of lies. It's twisted. It's not proper. It's all twisted up. You've made it into something it isn't, which is what these world kingdoms do. Because their father is the dragon, the serpent, then they take his twisted doctrines. And somehow these four kingdoms were able to even intermarry. If you know the history of the, these four empires, um, Alexander the Great literally died in Nebuchadnezzar's palace in Babylon. You have Greece, um, not just mingling with Persia and Medea, but also even mingling with Egypt. And so where Cleopatra was an Egyptian princess, she was actually a Greek, but then she's consorting with the Roman Mark Antony. And so you can see those kingdoms continuing to mingle even maybe after a preceding one has been destroyed. It's, it's still around, it's, it's weird. It's just, it's still around and they're in the same places, they're intermarrying and so forth. But those last two are, are not two that intermarry. They can make treaties. They can work together on things. They can have shared doctrines. They can have shared values or beliefs, but they're not close enough to marry the two and say that they're the same. Um, and again, the serpent was a liar from the beginning. And we look at the enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And this Torah portion helps us to understand that enmity, that enmity is part of an ongoing story. Because in this Torah portion, we see the dragon Pharaoh as basically not a body snatcher, but he is a baby snatcher. And so he waits for the children of the Hebrews to be born. And then he tells the midwives, kill them, basically asphyxiate them, hand them to their mother as though they're stillborn. And instead, of course, he encounters righteous midwives. They do not kill the babies. And then when he says, why is this happening? He says, well, you know, the Hebrew women, they're more vigorous. And by the time we get there, the babies are already born. It's too late to kill them. And he doesn't argue too much about that, but he does send out an additional edict that requires not just Hebrew boys be killed at birth. Instead, this time, he requires that both Egyptian 
and Hebrew boys be thrown into the Nile. Um, but by understanding the Torah portion, what the dragon is doing here is a baby snatcher. We understand what John is telling us in the book of Revelation about the dragon, because in, in the book of Revelation, we see the dragon who is also waiting for the male child of the woman to be born. And of course, in the time that we're talking about, the male child he was looking for, um, Midrash tells us that his sorcerers had prophesied to him that there would be a Moshia, a savior that would arise. And basically who would do the work of Moses. And knowing that this Moshia is going to be born, the sorcerers aren't real sure if it's an Egyptian or if it's a Hebrew or who it is. And so to just cover himself and make sure he kills all the male children, he orders that even the Egyptian boys be thrown into the Nile. Um, and that's how the dragon works. When he failed to kill Moses, who was that promised Moshia, as a type of Messiah being born in Bethlehem, Herod tried to kill him again. He was, did the work of the dragon. Um, and by the way, he would be an Edomite and therefore Roman seed of the dragon. Uh, because the, the Edomian kings, uh, they have some Jewish blood, but they're Edomian, they're, they're Edomite. And we'll, we'll look at it, but Edom is Rome. And, and the Jewish way of looking at it in the first century up until now, Edom is Rome. So there again, Rome's trying to do the baby snatching. But that's what the dragon does. He, he sees the woman in travail. He sees them about to give birth. And then of course, Pharaoh dispatches midwives to kill the children. But in the larger sense, what the dragon is doing is he's waiting for the children of women to be born. And then he's going to devour them within his beast kingdoms. He's going to use large systems, governmental systems, political systems, military systems, health systems, religious systems, educational system, any system that covers large groups of people. He will use those systems and interconnect them. And once he has them all interconnected, and I know you like, your head's about to burst open thinking this is exactly what the internet did for us. I mean, you can't even go to the doctor without using the internet nowadays. Um, you can go to church online. <laughs> um, you probably do a lot of your military sign up even on the internet today. The educational system right now is being conducted for a lot to a large extent through the internet because of COVID. And somehow with one little virus, the dragon has managed to really, I mean, they were already connected, but now they're just like a, a big, you know, fishing line tangle. You can't untangle from one because all these other systems are also tangled into it. And so this is how he can deceive the whole world, as it says in Revelation. It's, it's a big, confusing tangle of dragon scales and you're going to stick to some of them uh, that's how he works he he tries to get those scales so tight together that you can't get out of one without another system capturing you and dragging you back in there however the good news is the children whose names are written in the lamb's book of life they are going to be able to navigate the waters of these systems. Not without tribulation, but they will be able to navigate these waters without being drowned. You can walk through the fire, you won't be burned. You can walk through the flood and you won't be drowned. So don't be afraid to go to the doctor because it's a dragon system. You can navigate that system. 
Don't be afraid to be in the military. You can navigate that system. If you want to get into politics, get into politics. And, you know, God help you. But if he calls you to do that, if he tells you to do that, then you will be able to walk through that system with that mission. Daniel had to walk in a Babylonian system. That was his mission, but he was neither burned nor drowned. The Hebrew children weren't burned by the image of the beast. You see how that works, hopefully? I, I don't want you to go away being afraid of everything because that's what you see. You are saved even in the midst of the deception of the dragon's system. I'm just trying to show you how the father dragon has connected all these little offspring of his. So in last week's Torah portion where you, you saw Jacob adopting Ephraim and Menashe, the serpent also adopts his own children and becomes their father. And he gives them thrones. And each new kingdom, each successive offspring of the dragon is just like the one before it. Their goal, whether conscious or unconscious, is to imprison the children of the virtuous woman within their systems. Um, to twist around them, you know, like a boa constrictor, just squeeze them till they give up. But they can't do it because we do have a savior. We do have a Moshia. We do have Yeshua. We have both Moshe, who the dragon couldn't take, and we have Yeshua, who the dragon couldn't keep in the realm of death. And it's because of them, the Torah and the testimony, of Yeshua, that we can navigate through these systems of the beast and we don't have to be afraid. Now, these systems, they're called the four kingdoms. When we look at the image of the beast, there's four primary kingdoms. And of course, there's daughters that they're standing on. But these are prophesied all the way back in Genesis 15, 12 through 14. And it goes back to the covenant between the pieces where Abraham goes into a deep sleep, which is figurative of death. And it says a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, a dread, great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, know with certainty that your offspring shall be sojourners. That's an important word sojourners in a land not their own and they will oppress them 400 years and also the nation that will enslave them i shall punish so you you have to take each little piece of information and kind of stack one on top of the other to see what he is and isn't saying we tend to believe that, I don't know, maybe it's because of Charlton Heston, but somehow we think that when Israel um, went into Egypt, that they were there for 400 years before they were released. But the time clock started much sooner than that. Plus within it is a prophecy of the four kingdoms. And so using a Rashi commentary concerning that Torah portion, he's commenting on Genesis 15. He says, the dread and the darkness are the travails of all the exiles. Now, if we get to it tonight, we're going to get into a passage where Yeshua, he just out of the blue says, my soul is troubled. My soul is in tribulation. And then he, he starts to say things that people, a voice comes from heaven and some people around it hear it like thunder and others think, well, maybe an angel said something to him. They're hearing what happens differently, but he gets a direct message from heaven. After he says, you know, my soul is experiencing tribulation. You can tell it's something so heavy for him to have this kind of an outburst. And 
then he goes on and, and in that little lecture that he gives them after that, and we're going to break it down piece by piece because I want you to see where you've seen that before in the Torah. Uh, but at the end of that little lecture, he starts talking about for a little while now you have the light. You need to walk in the light. You need to be sons of light. And because the rest of his lecture is connected um, to these topics that we're talking about, it makes sense that he would bring up being sons of light and walking in the light because this exile or these, this series of exiles the, under the subjugation of the four kingdoms, it's connected to Abram's dread and darkness that the times of the exiles are going to be times of dread and darkness. And it's like when Yeshua gives that statement, he's telling them that you're on the verge. You're on the verge. You're about 30, 35 years away from another exile. The dread and the darkness you think is already here, it's going to get worse. But he says that the calculation of the 400 years begins from the time Isaac was born until Israel left Egypt. And he says this because, of course, Genesis 21.5 says Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. But according to Rashi, these 400 years represent the four kingdoms that are going to try to swallow Isaac. They're going to try to swallow Sarah's seed, because remember, they have almost identical promises. Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Sarah, you're going to be the mother of many nations. And it's going to be the seed of the woman. And so these successive kingdoms are going to try to swallow Sarah's seed, the seed of the virtuous woman. Remember, Sarah is Jerusalem above, obedient. The testimony of Yeshua, that's how you know who Sarah is, because her children have the testimony of Yeshua and the commandments of God. Before Yeshua, they would have had a testimony of resurrection and the commandments of God. That's what would have identified them. And so each of these four kingdoms of the beast, their goal is to try to devour Sarah's seed, the children of the woman who are going to have that testimony of resurrection and they're going to have the Torah. They're going to have those two things. The reason that Rashi says Isaac's birth starts the time clock is because the, the wording of the prophecy, it says your offspring shall be sojourners in a land, not their own. It does not say in the land of Egypt. And so he lists these verses of sojourning. Abraham sojourned, that's Genesis 21, 34. Isaac sojourned, that's Genesis 26, 3 and 6. Jacob sojourned, chapter 47, verse 4. And that word there for sojourning, the root of it is gur. And gur suggests transient habitation. We don't see Israel inheriting their promise until the end of the Egyptian exile and an additional 40 years in the wilderness. And then once they cross the Jordan and come in from that direction, and then there's, they can do battle, they can start to apportion the inheritance among the tribes. Um, until that time, they're really in a state of sojourning, even if they are in the land. There were certain steps that had to fall into place before they could be more than sojourners. And um, in terms of, well, what is that fourth sojourning? Ezekiel 20 verses 34 through 38 tells us that there is a fourth sojourning. There was Abraham sojourning, Isaac sojourning, Jacob sojourning, but then Israel itself the children of the woman are in a fourth sojourning 
up until this day, he says, among the peoples. And then Rashi goes on and he says, the text says, and also the nation that enslaves them I will punish. He's telling you that it's more than just Egypt that he's talking about, that he's including the four kingdoms, which are going to correspond, there's going to be four sojournings. There's going to be four kingdoms besides Egypt who are going to subjugate Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Because he says those kingdoms too will be annihilated because they subjugated Israel. And he says, these periods, these four kingdoms are known collectively as Arba, which is four, Machuyot, which is kingdoms. That's from Daniel 8, 22. And each is called by the name of the empire dominant in the world at that particular time. And then he points out one of the exiles, the Greek exile, represented by the, the bronze kind of torso, I guess you'd call it. Even though the Jews were in Judea and the Galilee, nevertheless, it was an exile because he says it was marked by civil strife, anti-religious campaigns, and rejection of Torah values by a large number of Jews who adopted Greek culture with all its abominations. In other words, the the righteous Jews were becoming a minority among their own people. And that was the, the tension of the, the Greek, the Hellenistic culture over against more of the, the Torah culture. So he says the downfall of the Greek empire and the rise of Rome marks the beginning of the Galut Edom that fourth kingdom, the kingdom with the legs of iron, that is called the Galut Edom, which means the Edomite or the Roman exile. And he says, it is this millennia long exile that we are still in today. And, and here you can see just one example of how they're equating Eden with Rome. Now, as we get farther into the Song of Songs, I don't know if it'll be this week, maybe next week, depends on how, how far we get, um, but it draws the relationship between Edom and Rome even more clearly, because if you're like me, you've been sitting here for the last 20 years going, well, how exactly did they derive that Rome is Edom? Well, we're going to look at some of those details of how they derive it and why they see the Roman Empire and now its daughters, why they would also even include Christianity as part of the Roman exile because it's descended, it's a daughter system of the Holy Roman Empire that came out of Rome. And so they think that they are still, that this fourth sojourning that Ezekiel talks about, where Israel is sojourning among the peoples, it's part of this Roman exile. And you can still see that mixed into the feet and the toes of the image of the beast. And so... Um, just, I put the prophecy up here so you could look at it all together again and see how the covenant between the pieces is kind of lined up there. So we've got 400 years of sojourning and enslavement and enslavement, sojourning and enslavement. Um, and then how can we look at that? Well, even if we look at the 10 plagues, uh, that's going to be important because that's going to be part of the judgment of the, the and nation and also the nation. So the one who enslaves them, specifically the one that's remembered as enslaving them, is Egypt. And so 
out of this deal, they get 10 plagues and they lose their possessions because the Hebrews take their, their loot out with them. They're being judged. So they're going to be judged by 10 plagues. Uh, and ultimately, he's going to draw the dragon Pharaoh into the Reed Sea, along with the fish stuck to his scales, and he's going to drown them there. But when we look for Elijah each year, those of you who are doing a, a Passover Seder, if you're doing a more Jewish Orthodox Seder, you're, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about Elijah's cup, that uh, fourth cup. When we place that cup on the table for Elijah, it's, it's not like, you know, leaving cookies for Santa Claus. It's serious. And it's an ancient custom. Because we know that even though it's kind of fun because we send the kids to the door to go look for Elijah, if Elijah were actually standing there, it would be bad news bears because the wrath of the lamb has come. That's what Elijah comes to announce. He comes to herald the wrath of the lamb and that the lamb is coming. And so when we look at that cup, yes, it's part of the Passover Seder, but again, that's a cup the nations are going to have to drink because they are going to be judged for afflicting Israel. And those four kingdoms, um, the, the principles of the beast have just been passed down from kingdom to kingdom. So both the dragon and the beast kingdom of the present day will be judged and in so doing judge all those kingdoms of the beast and we can see how the first beast kingdom i mean we're almost smacked over the head with this if if we're looking for the image of the beast what does that represent who is that and so forth and, and we always want to pin a name on things which is not always a smart thing to do because we can get distracted looking for a person when we should be looking for a system. Daniel 4, 15 and 16, remember King Nebuchadnezzar II has had a dream and Daniel has interpreted this dream for it. And of course, you know, it's the, the dream of the tree and it's a wonderful tree and all the birds of the air come and nest in it and so forth and then it gets cut off. And this is a prophecy of what's going to happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. And what he did notice was that there was bands of iron and bronze around the stump of the tree that were just going to kind of hold it together until it could grow again. And here's what Daniel says. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. And that's the key. It goes all the way back to the garden. When Adam and Eve conformed to the image of the beast, when they took on his way of thinking about death and obedience, then their minds were changed from that of a man and they started thinking with a beast's mind. They began thinking like the most cunning beast of the field, the dragon. And so in King Nebuchadnezzar II, we literally see this happen to him. He goes from acting like a human being to acting like a beast to show us that he is the first of these beast kingdoms. He is the offspring of the dragon. And it, it shows you what happens when a man conforms to the image of a beast. He says, let a beast mind be given to him. And so even though he's drenched with the dew of heaven, and remember dew of heaven is a metaphor for the word, for the Torah. It's a, it's a word of resurrection. It's, it's not an idle word. Um, it's a word of life. And so even though 
he is drenched with the dew of heaven. In other words, the testimony is all around him. He's got Daniel, he's got Shadrach, he's got Meshach, he's got Abednego, and he's got an entire population of Jews within his kingdom. And even though he is drenched with people who have the word and who advise him according to the word, he's absolutely drenched with life in the word. It's not penetrating. And because he does not allow himself to even entertain the idea that he is not the king of kings and his kingdom will not ascend above the height of the clouds, that he will not be able to sit on the Mount of the Moed as he thought he could. This is what Isaiah tells us. Because of his pride, and he will tell you, if you read the whole chapter, he will admit it was his pride. And because of his pride, his mind was changed to a beast's. And that's what pride does. It anchors us in the here and the now and the my kingdom. And you will not entertain the idea that you will die. There will be resurrection, some to an everlasting reward and some to everlasting punishment. You just can't think that far. You get the mind of a beast. And, and the more you think about the here and the now and reject the dew of heaven, the word of resurrection, the more you will think like a beast. So let's, let's look at a passage out of the Talmud. I don't, I don't think we'll hurt anybody if we read this, but I, I do want to see, I want you to see their thinking on this bondage in Egypt um, so that you can see the progression of what the dragon is doing. And it says, uh, and Pharaoh charged all his people saying, every son, that is born, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And that's Exodus 122. <clears throat> it says the use of the phrase, every son that is born, indicates that he decreed even on his own nation that all their male babies must be killed. And Rabbi Yosef, son of Rabbi Hanina, says further, he decreed three decrees. Initially, he commanded the midwives only with regard to the Jewish infants. You shall look upon the stones. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, she shall live. And afterward, he decreed with regard to the Jewish infants, every son that is born, you shall cast into the river. And ultimately, he decreed even on his own nation that Egyptian infant boys should be cast into the river as well. That's every son. That's not distinguishing between Jews and Egyptians. It's the sons of the world. Because it could be that out there, even in Egypt land, which does represent the world, that a savior could arise. And out of fear, and, and that's how sorcery works, by the way, it will often latch on to a, a true prophetic insight, but it can never see it distinctly. And then it, it makes mistakes. It makes serious mistakes. And that's why you don't want to turn to sorcery. They will give you part of the picture that will actually be accurate and make you think that they have the ultimate power that's the problem and that's the deception. By giving you enough to make you think it's valid, you will be lured in. And so Pharaoh is kind of lured in into even killing his own male warriors because these Egyptian baby boys are going to grow up to be warriors. Think how many more warriors would have stuck to his scales had he not ordered them thrown in to the river. And remember, he thinks he is the dragon of the Nile. He thinks he's the source. He identifies with that river. And so basically he's saying, sacrifice the baby boys to me. 
And just like his brood after him, King Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander, you know, and the others, it's going to be his pride that is his downfall. So this is why Ezekiel is preoccupied with Pharaoh in Egypt, then the actual monster crouched at the door. He wants you to understand where the monster at the door came from, that it's not an isolated world event. If we're looking at, say, COVID-19 today, it's not an isolated world event. It's, it's part of a continuous, continual, continual string of events. I'm mixing up continuous and continual. So even when we get to the book of Revelation, we know that John is linking his current Roman Iron Kingdom exile to Babylon. He says, come out, come out from among her, my people. Babylon the Great has fallen, fallen. But then he links it also to the Egyptian exile because he's, he's listing the plagues of Egypt. He's talking about the dragon. He's talking about what Pharaoh symbolizes, the, the red dragon. And he even references Pharaoh's order to take the Hebrew baby boys when they're born and to throw them into the Nile. In other words, to sacrifice them to the Tanin, the sea dragon of the Nile. And it goes back to, he thought himself divine. So John is going to see the dragon and he is going to see the beast kingdoms. He's going to see the multiple beast kingdoms. Each of those in some way thought themselves eternal. And just like their father, Pharaoh, who said, I have created myself. Um, they thought it was all under their control, which each of those kingdoms has toppled, except we still see the influence of Rome today. We are still in that Roman exile. Um, but here's what John says. When, when we're talking about him looking at the dragon as like the midwife. Revelation 12, one says, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars, and she was with child. And of course, Pharaoh's given the order to the midwives. When you go, kill the baby boys. And it says, and she cried out being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. So we see two components of our Torah portion. We see the dragon, I guess, recognizing that the midwives would deceive him. And so he himself stands before the woman who's about to give birth. He is going to function as, you know, the killer midwife. And then so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Okay, that's, that's not gonna be successful. And then we, we're going to read, and we'll get into that later, how he sends out the flood. He, he thinks, well, I couldn't devour the child. Let me send out a flood. And that's the second set of decrees. If you can't, if the midwives can't get it done on the birthing stools, then throw them into the Nile. Let the Nile consume them because he was the sea dragon. If you throw them into the Nile, I can get them there. So, <coughs> excuse me. The dragon, just to sum up, because I know our timer went off, just to sum up, the dragon takes the place of the midwives when John sees it. He's waiting to kill the male child, which is the prophesied Moshiach. They say that's what Pharaoh's sorcerers saw. They saw a Moshiach, a savior, 
which we know is Moses. In the Torah portion, it's Moses. In the Gospels, it's going to be Yeshua. But he's failed with the, the midwives. He's failed in Bethlehem. And so he's gone to plan C. Plan A, kill Moses. You can't kill the Torah. Plan B, kill the testimony, Yeshua. He couldn't kill the testimony. He thought he killed the testimony. And then there was the resurrection, which is the testimony. He can't unresurrect Yeshua. <laughs> it's just, you can't unresurrect the word. It's life. And he says, okay, plan C. I couldn't kill Moses. I couldn't kill Yeshua. But there are people who are running around with these two things. There are offspring in the same way that the dragon has offspring. The dragon has the beast kingdoms, the four kingdoms. In the same way, the father in heaven has offspring with the woman, the virtuous woman. Remember Sarah above? She is our mother. These are children who don't just have the Torah. They have a spiritual Torah. They have the Torah from above. They have the letter and the spirit of the Torah. They have the testimony of Yeshua. They have that testimony of resurrection. He says, okay, I couldn't kill the woman. And I couldn't kill Moses. I couldn't kill Yeshua, but I can definitely make war with her children. And he has been doing that ever since he couldn't kill Moses and Yeshua. He's never stopped. It's, it's been one constant motion of trying to kill those offspring. So you need to understand, you need to be prepared. This is why I think Yeshua said, woe to those who are nursing children in those days. You're gonna have to grow up fast, child. Because if you have the testimony of Yeshua and his resurrection, if you have that good news of the gospel and you have embraced the Torah of Moses, then you are an especial threat because you won't stick to his scales. He doesn't have enough super glue in the world to make you stick to his scales. So he's making war with those children. He's trying to snatch those babies. He's a baby snatcher. He will try to find those children when they are at their most vulnerable. And one thing we can say about children is that is the stage of life where you are more controlled by your soul. The nefesh, appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. They have not yet achieved a maturity to be able to distinguish between the things of the spirit based on it is written and the things of the soul, which is based on, I think I feel I want. In fact, the things of the soul, I think I feel I want will masquerade as the spirit. Well, if I felt that it, it must be the spirit wrong. That's not biblical. <laughs> That's not true. It's the way you feel, it's the way you think, it's what you want. It doesn't mean it's true and it doesn't mean it's life. You have to begin to want what the spirit wants. You have to feel what the spirit feels. You have to think what the spirit thinks. We tend to just flip that over and drag the spirit along for the ride. And when we get to the end of that, and we realize what we thought we felt and we wanted really wasn't based on what was true and what was written. We have just dragged the spirit with us through all our kingdoms of pride, you know, and, and that's a pride that has to be broken in a believer. That's what it means. Take up your cross daily. You're going to have to die. Don't be deceived about death. That was the original deception. Adam and Eve did not understand death or they wouldn't have sinned. 
had they truly had Eve, maybe Adam did, Eve did not understand. It says the serpent deceived her. You will not surely die. Oh, yes, you did, babe. It didn't look like you died right off the bat, but you did. You began dying the second you sinned. You failed to think through the, the implications of death and to see beyond it. And that's the primary way that the serpent is going to make war with us. He's going to try to anchor us in the here and now. He's going to try to anchor us in anxiety. He's going to anchor us in anger. He's going to anchor us in frustration. He's going to anchor us and worry about tomorrow. He's going to try to anchor us with health issues. Any system he can use to attack us, he will. So that we get all tangled up in it. But we have to understand these systems, they're just part of his offspring. And they're, they're trying to draw us in to stick to his scales so that he will solve all our government problems. He will solve all our political problems. He'll solve all our military problems. He'll solve all our health problems. He'll solve all our religious questions. But they're under his control. So how can he? We don't stick to those scales. We have to live within those systems but we don't have to conform to the image of the beast within those systems. We are sojourners. And the sooner we accept that, the faster we'll grow up. The more important we'll understand how it is not to be at that level of line upon line, precept upon precept. Time's too short for that now. That's what the Haftorah says. Time's too short. You can't do it with the verse of the day anymore. You have to immerse yourself in, in the word. And you have to hang on to your testimony of Yeshua as if it's the only life raft in the ocean. And it is. It is. It's that important. And so, yes, all of these things are going to come and they're, they're going to get worse. That's what tribulation does. It squeezes you into narrower and narrower and narrower. So if you think it's bad now, it's going to be worse. And when it's worse, you say, well, it can't get any worse. It's going to get worse. And as it gets worse, you're, you're going to have a choice. You're going to want to run back to Egypt, which is what happened to the children Remember, it says he took the woman into the wilderness to nourish her a time and time and half a time. We're going to look at that passage, and it's going to line up with what Yeshua was saying when he says, oh, my soul is troubled. My soul is tribulation. My soul is troubled. He could feel it. He could feel what was coming, just like the dread and the darkness that Abram felt coming on his offspring. I feel this darkness coming. And he says, walk in the light while you can. Grow up while you can. And some friends were over last night and we were talking about that. And we were talking about Sarah's tent. I'm going to quit sharing this so I can see you. We were talking about how fast Rebecca had to grow up when she came from a place of idolatry. She was a righteous girl. And Abraham's servant said, will you go? And he's like, let her stay 10 days. No, she's got to go now. They ask her, will you go? She's like, I got to get out of here. I know I got to get out of here. I can't stay 10 more days or I'll be lost. 10, 10 more days here is my death. And it can't be undone. I got to go now. I got to go to Isaac now. And apparently she was a very young girl at the time. She had a nurse. You realize that? I don't know if you caught that. Once 
one little blurb about it, but she had a nurse that went with her. She was that young. She had somebody to take care of her. And so when she gets there, Isaac puts her in Sarah's tent. And then after that, you know, he loved her. There was something that had to occur in Sarah's tent with Rebecca. And there's, there's three miracles that are associated traditionally with Sarah's tent. There's the, the Shabbat candles that stayed lit continuously. It's like the presence of Adonai was always in the tent, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the bread was just miraculous. And what was the third one? It just slipped. Where did it go? The clouds. The cloud. So those three things grew her up fast. She had to grow up fast in order, look at all the time she lost, yes, but don't bemoan the time you lost. Just go into Sarah's tent. Remember, she's our mother above, Jerusalem above. And start growing up fast in the word. Rebecca had to learn everything she didn't learn in her father's house. Everything she didn't learn in a house of idolatry she had to learn. And then she had to unlearn any idolatry she knew in Sarah's tent. And so that's encouragement for us. If you say, oh, no, I'm behind, I'm behind. You know, I always thought line upon line, precept upon precept was the way to go. No, it's a bad prophecy. <laughs> it's not a good prophecy. It says you can't learn like that and grow up. It says you'll become a drunkard. You'll have that, you'll become that silly if that's how you think you can move with him in a time of tribulation. And so I'm just putting the call out. I, sometimes I call you guys homeroom moms and dads. So I'm calling on you homeroom moms and dads. There is going to be a lot of babies being born, not just physical babies, but spiritual babies, because it's the more they afflicted them, the more they increased. The more these plagues come in, the more increase of babies there is going to be. I don't know what age they'll be, but the, there'll be children who are going to need encouragement, who are going to need nurses, who are going to need midwives. And they're going to need help with the basics, like what's a Torah portion? They're going to need help with the basics, like what is the testimony of Yeshua? And we got to be there. Because if we're not, the dragon will be. The, his offspring, the beast systems are there to snatch them. And the whole thing is to make them dependent upon the system instead of their creator. We function within the systems, but we don't worship or depend upon them for tomorrow. There is only one that we can depend upon for a tomorrow that will outlast this physical body. We don't want to ever allow them to misconstrue death. And so being an example, um, I think Dallas Willard He's a great Christian writer. I think he called it the spirit of the disciplines. The spirit of the disciplines. A disciple is disciplined. And so it's time to wean some of these babies. We got to get them off Facebook learning. We've got to get them off random learning. 
going here, going there, picking up a line here, picking up a line there, and it, they're just assembling a bunch of crazy doctrines. They need foundational teaching and mentoring. Your, your congregational leaders, they need your help because they're responsible for these babies. And it's just like, if you have a house full of babies, you can't keep an eye on them all. And you'll have some running through the doggy door. <laughs> you'll have some throwing baseballs through the window and you'll have some over at the neighbor's house learning new things, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm just telling you, I'm warning you. We might think that we feel useless and impotent, stuck in our houses, or behind masks, we are not useless. And if you're willing to mentor somebody, I may put the call out here pretty soon because there's so many new people and they're asking me questions that tell me they need help. They need a stable, mature nurse like Rebecca had who can escort them into the tent so they can grow up fast. Because that's when the time of exile, it says, started when Isaac was born. Um, that darkness and dread, I think it's about to come to an end soon, but at the end, it's going to be the worst before it gets, before we start to see the light. So encourage yourself, but be prepared you know, to stick that hand out and say, if you, you're going to have to trust me, you don't know me, <laughs> but you're going to have to trust somebody right now. And that's not easy to do, especially if they've been wounded or injured in a synagogue or in a church or even never been there and just got wounded by synagogue or church people. If they've got those wounds back there, because not every fellowship is a safe fellowship. You know, and, and at the same time, we're reaching a hand out. We got to be careful that it's it's not a beast, that it's not a silver arm <laughs> stuck out there um, trying to disrupt. I mean, it's, it's going to take spiritual discernment. It's going to take prayer and there won't be a passage in the Torah you can turn to that'll help you fix today's interpersonal skill problem. It'll be a general precept that a grown up fixes out of self-sacrifice, knowing how to die a little bit for the benefit of the baby. Because that was the risk the midwives took. You realize they risked their lives. Pharaoh could have thrown them in the Nile. Instead, Adonai built houses for them. You will have, those will be your offspring in a sense. Those will be your children. He will build you houses that aren't even your natural children. So that, that, I got a little preachy there at the end. Um, but there's just urgency. I don't know what it is. There's urgency right now. I'm not afraid. I'm not anxious. I'm not sad. I'm not depressed. But I'm urgent. And if I wasn't urgent, when I looked at the Hoff Torah, I... <laughs> I get the message now. No more playing around with Torah. So that, that's meant to encourage you to hopefully to give you that good energy going forward. You got a goal, you know what's coming. If you know what's coming, you'll be prepared for it. And it's okay if you don't have every answer. I certainly don't. You hear me say, I don't know way more often than I say I know, or I say I might know. Here's Here's a thought, but they need you as a nurse or a midwife before they need somebody with all the answers. You just have to pass on the fundamentals. So I'll stop there. Oops.
almost hit the meeting button instead of the recording button.